so you're graduating um, here in a few months. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Oh, congratulations. Where are you going to go if you want to share? Uh, I'm likely going to stay uh, here at Dallas Children's. Um, I've got a, my basic science research project is just getting going. So I've got a lot more work here to do. Well, excellent. Um, so I see from your um, bio that um, you are a pediatric physician science scientist training program um, looking at basic and translational research in the field of pediatric obesity. Mm -hmm. So this definitely is uh, in your um, lane of expertise. So I'm very excited to hear about um, your case. Um, so go ahead and take it away. All right. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Steelman. Um, so I'll be presenting uh, a short case series today of two very young patients with mutations in GNAS causing pseudo-hypoparathyroidism type 1A with severe infantile onset obesity. Um, we do not have any conflicts of interest to disclose. So my first patient is a Hispanic girl um, who was born at home with a normal birth weight. Um, she came to endocrine attention at seven days of life due to mild hypothyroidism first diagnosed on the newborn screen uh, with an initial TSH of 18 and a normal free T4. She had a NICU course, which was remarkable for transient hypoglycemia requiring IV dextrose. Of note, she was an infant of a diabetic mother. She also had some hypothermia warranting a sepsis workup, which was ultimately negative, and she had jaundice that required phototherapy. Her family history was notable for a mother with diabetes, unknown type, but notably diagnosed in adulthood without obesity. And her mother also, are, also had learning disabilities and short stature. I show her weight for length curve over here on the right. Um, as I pointed out, she had a normal birth weight when we met her at around one week old and we started thyroid hormone. Um, despite adequate control of her hypothyroidism, she had really brisk weight gain during her first several months of life. She started coming off the curves at around three months of age. And then at six months of age, her PCP referred her to uh, the nutrition clinic. Uh, they also referred her at that time to physical therapy for some gross motor delays. Her weight gain became a little more dramatic by nine months old. So at that point, uh, we in endocrine recommended that uh, she undergo genetic testing for early onset obesity. This was done via the Invite Monogenic Obesity Panel, which identified a novel frame shift mutation in GNAS, as well as two variants of unknown significance in FBN3 and SCLT1. Subsequent evaluation was notable for elevated uh, parathyroid hormone level uh, in the context of normocalcemia and colbicalciferol replacement was initiated. She also developed a subcutaneous ossification on the plantar surface of her foot by two years old, uh, which limited ambulation, and she had continued gross motor and speech delays. As of her last measurements at three years old, she weighed 50 pounds, which qualifies her for a diagnosis of class three severe obesity with a BMI at 146% of the 95th percentile. Moving on to my second patient, patient B. He is a biracial male of uh, Caucasian and African-American parentage. He was also born at term with a normal birth weight. He also had mild hypothyroidism detected on his initial newborn screen, though unfortunately he had a delay in follow-up labs until he was five months old. At that time, his TSH was 20 and his free T4 was 0 0.9. He also had a remarkable NICU course, which included transient hypoglycemia requiring IV dextrose. Of note, he was not an infant of a diabetic mother, and this was attributed to poor feeding at the time. Much like my first patient as well, he also had jaundice, which required phototherapy. He also had notable findings on his initial birth exam, which included hypospadias, borderline cryptorchidism, and an unidentified lesion on his right knee, which was uh, firm, raised, and erythematous, but not definitively identified at the time. He had an unremarkable family history. I show his weight for length curve over here on the right, which is even more dramatic than that of my first patient. You can see here, he also had a normal birth weight initially and steeply climbed over his first few months of life. By the time he was three months old, he weighed 19 pounds and parents were start, first starting to notice some hyperphagic behaviors. Um, he basically was uh, drinking a large bottle every one to two hours around the clock. I first met him when he was five months old and he weighed 29 pounds, which at the time was the same weight as my two-year-old daughter. 
Um, we started thyroid hormone. Uh, his exam at that first visit was also notable for some really dramatic respiratory distress when he laid supine that was not present when he was sitting up or prone. So we referred to a sleep study at that time. And we also recommended genetic testing. In his case, we used the Rhythm Pharmaceuticals Prevention Genetics Uncovering Rare Obesity Panel, which identified a, a different novel frame shift mutation in GNAS and a different variant of unknown significance in MKS1. The knee lesion that was noted at birth was later determined to be a subcutaneous ossification, which fortunately did not appear to limit physical function for him. He has actually had surprisingly excellent developmental progress, but the sleep study that we got did notably at less than one year old demonstrate severe OSA with hypoxia. Um, as of his most recent measures at one year old, he weighs 46 pounds, although we do not have criteria to define severe obesity in less than two year olds. Um, his weight for length Z score is positive sevens, which is highly suggestive of severe obesity. So um, in the interest of time, I'm going to give a very brief, very simplistic review of inactivating GNAS mutation disorders. Um, GNAS encodes the alpha, the stimulatory uh, G alpha subunit um, that mediates signal transduction for many of our G protein coupled receptors that mediate uh, the action of so many of our hormones. Um, and individuals with inactivating mutations in GNAS therefore often have multi-hormone resistance. Um, for example, in the case of my patients, uh, TSH resistance causing mild hypothyroidism or PTH resistance, uh, which when untreated causes hypocalcemia. And it's the PTH resistance that gives this disorder the name pseudohypoparathyroidism. These individuals also very commonly have an array of skeletal findings, including subcutaneous ossifications, which are collectively known as Albright's hereditary osteodystrophy. And then these individuals often commonly have obesity, including both early onset and severe obesity. Um, there is a spectrum of uh, phenotypic presentation depending on tissue specific uh, imprinting patterns. Um, basically, individuals who have a mutation on the maternal allele tend to exhibit the full phenotype, whereas individuals with the mutation on the paternal allele uh, usually do not have any degree of multi-hormone resistance, although they do have uh, Albright's hereditary osteodystrophy and a milder degree of obesity. And this, dis this pattern is usually referred to as pseudo-pseudo-hypoparathyroidism. Uh, it's also possible to have mutations in other genes that affect the imprinting at the GNAS locus, causing some degrees of these phenotypes as well, and that's usually referred to as PHP1B. Um, so because uh, my patients have a mutation in GNAS and the all three components of this phenotype, uh, they have been given a diagnosis of pseudohypoparathyroidism type 1A. It was striking to me that in both of these patients' cases, there were uh, complications during the neonatal period that appeared highly similar. They both had hypoglycemia and they both had hyperbilirubinemia. The neonatal uh, complications of GNAS mutations have not been rigorously reported in the literature, but there are some hints in case reports that this may be a common finding. Um, several case reports mention either uh, hypoglycemia or jaundice or both during the neonatal period. So it's possible that neonatal complications may be an aspect of this disorder that has not yet been fully studied. What's been more rigorously studied is the obesity phenotype of GNAS mutations. I show here a scatter plot um, from a cohort of GNAS mutation patients that's been really thoroughly studied uh, from a group out of Vanderbilt. And you can see that there's a really wide range of um, uh, severity of obesity in patients with this disorder, but I've plotted here in the stars, uh, my two patients, and you can see that they fit right in with what's out there in the published literature in terms of obesity severity. Of note, I mentioned the really dramatic severe OSA that my one-year-old has. Um, uh, it is actually pretty well reported in the literature that individuals with GNAS mutations have OSA to a degree out of proportion to their BMI. The reasons for this are still, um, have been speculated upon, but are still a little bit unclear so far. 
Um, one interesting thing to point out is that there was a recent study in the New England Journal of Medicine that did whole exome sequencing on a cohort of patients with severe obesity and found a really strong prevalence of GNAS mutations uh, in that population, 0.8% in um, the population that they studied, um, which is a much higher number, much higher prevalence than I think people have realized before um, and did not always occur with the other aspects of the PHP or Albright's phenotype. Um, and so this may be a more common cause of severe obesity than we realize. So to conclude uh, here today, I've reported two novel frame shift mutations of GNAS, which in the case of these patients is associated with pseudohypoparathyroidism type 1a with severe infantile onset obesity. These cases highlight that GNAS mutations should be suspected as a cause of early onset obesity. They highlight the increased prevalence of OSA in individuals with GNAS mutations and point to possible as yet unstudied neonatal complications of the disorder. Um, I'll also point out that in uh, both of my cases, genetic testing showed some variant, uh, variants of unknown significance in other genes that are known to be associated with obesity. The role of modifier genes in determining obesity severity and variability in individuals with GNAS mutations has not really been studied at all so far um, and seems to warrant further research. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the other physicians who have helped me with this case, uh, the funding sources that support my salary, and I'll take any questions. Thank you very much. Very interesting and challenging cases. Um, I, one question I have uh, while we wait to see if there's anyone else that has questions is about the hypoglycemia. That intrigues me. I mean, I believe I heard you say the first one was an infant of a diabetic mother or that mm -hmm. mom had gestational diabetes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, um, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, 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 please. But, but anyway, I'm just curious if you have uh, to speculate or what, you know, with the published previous um, reports, is there any um, thought as far as what the pathophysiology is? Yeah, I don't think that's um, well understood yet at all. Um, I can tell you that, um, yes, in my case, one of them was an infant of a diabetic mother. The other was not. Notably, the, the patient who was an infant of, di of a diabetic mother, I don't have genetic testing on mom, but I rather strongly suspect that she has Albright's hereditary osteodystrophy with um, diabetes resulting from that as well. Um, but uh, again, the other, the other, uh, child does not, um, what's, uh, the one thing I can, um, point you to in the literature is that there are mouse models of GNAS mutations, which also had some degree of early lethality due to hypoglycemia. Um, but I don't believe that the mechanism for that is known yet. Um, uh, I, I don't think in many aspects of, um, GNAS mutation phenotypes, I don't think they've all nailed down, you know, which G protein couple receptor pathway to, to blame each effect on. So I don't think that's known yet. And, um, if you um, recall, how severe was the high and for long was the hypoglycemia? Was it fairly transient or was it a bit more other features that maybe would be, you know, more in character with like a severe presentation. No, in both cases, they were very transient, easily managed with IV dextrose, neither required glucagon or diazoxide, um, and uh, neither lasted more than a day or so. Okay. And then um, you, uh, the obesity is very striking. How was the linear growth on these children? The linear growth is very well preserved on these children. Um, uh, often uh, these patients do develop short stature due to a certain degree of uh, GHRH resistance, um, but the published literature seems to uh, suggest that that comes a little bit later in life and is not really present during the uh, infant toddler period that I've known these kids at so far. Well, thank you very much.